wants us to see that if there is no God in the picture, and if we can't for a moment set him aside and look at the world, and there is only that which is under the sun, then this is what we have to look forward to, is this cycle of futility. And then the question comes, then what's the point? In verse 3, he, the, answer, the question he asks us is, what advantage does man have in all of his work? Why do we do what we do then? If it's all pointless and there, this is all that there is, then why do what we do? It's really pointless. He's going to give us another thought, and this is going to come in the next section. I'm going to plant this in your, in your heads for next time. But in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, as he moves into a section dealing with knowledge and wisdom, he is going to help us understand that all our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. I, I realized this when I was at Bible college, that the more that I learned, the more I realized how much I didn't know. And it brought me more and more face to face with my own ignorance and the things that I was not aware of and did not have a clue on and I really needed to know. But the more that I kept studying, the more that I went to class, the more that I read books and all of these things, I continued to be confronted with the reality of my own ignorance. And if it were not for God, we would be hopeless and helpless. And this is what Solomon wants us to contemplate. The biblical background, and I'm going to give this to you. If you look with me in chapter 12, verse 1, there is this background of Genesis. 12.1, he is going to refer to God as the Creator. Capital C, he is the Creator. He is going to refer to him in chapter 11, verse 5. If you look at the top of the page there in the NAS, he refers to him as God, as the Maker of all things. And he is going to draw from terminology that we find in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. He talks about the fact that then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So he is going to use all of this terminology from Genesis. So this is the backdrop for Ecclesiastes. And we need to understand that when he even refers to God 40 times in this book, he never uses the covenant name Yahweh. Never. It's always Elohim. This is Genesis chapter 1. He is Elohim, the creator of all things. And so this is the backdrop for us. And I'm going to start us here because he's going to deal with the, the vanity and futility of. And he's going to give us the backdrop of Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve, they were subjected to death and decay as a result of their disobedience to God. Because Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden then, creation has been placed under a curse after the fall. And it remains so. This is the thing that Paul dwells on in Romans chapter 8. Why be surprised when we have suffering in our life? Why? Because the world has been subjected to a curse. It's been rendered futile. It will not function as God originally designed it to function. It lives in a state of futility until God restores all things and the glory.
that even in his own life, it was short-lived. It was like a vapor. It was breath exhaled on a cold morning. It just was there and then gone. This is Psalm 90, as we dwell on the fact of our transitoriness in relation to an eternal God. So this is where Solomon is going to bring us. Without God, there is no meaning and purpose to our life. Without God, everything is futile. If only everything is rendered to under the sun, then there is no meaning to anything, and it's all pointless. In Genesis 5, we have the pace picks up a little bit more rapidly. We have those who have sons. They grow old. They die. We have vapor after vapor after vapor after vapor. And we have human mortality as established clearly in Genesis. And that is the backdrop for Ecclesiastes. The flow of this book is this. We have the title and the thesis given in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And then we have the first catalog of vanities that come in chapter 1, verse 4 through 226. And so we have the vanity in the natural world. We have vanity of wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge, vanity of pleasure, possessions, and accomplishments, more vanity on wisdom, and then vanity of labor. And then the amazing thing is that Solomon is going to give us a reprieve. And he is going to give us the first, if you will, in chapter 2, verses 24 to 26, he's going to give us the first, if you will, carpe diem statement. Anyone knows the, the, the designation carpe diem, right? Seize the day. I really don't care for that because it's a secular expression, but essentially this is what he tells us. But I have my own expression. I coined it. It's divina carpe. It is embrace the divinity. Because this is really what he wants us to do. He book. But then we have the divine inspiration in chapter 12, verse 11. And we saw this last week. He is the one shepherd, ultimate source of revelation, comes from God himself. But Solomon is a supreme, credible author. If anyone can talk to life under the sun and the vanity and the futility of all of the things that you can pursue in this life, he is the one to tell us this. Because in reality, he is a man who had everything. And still at the end of it all, he said it was futile. Even though I possessed more than anyone else on the face of the earth, whether it be wisdom, whether it be riches, whether it be land, whether it be wives or concubines, it doesn't matter. I had it all. I had every pleasure you could ever think about that any man could ever want to delight in. I've had it all. And yet at the same time, my end result is it is vanity of vanities. So this is a powerful statement that he makes, and he is going to carry this through this letter. He is Koheleth, and this is how I refer to him. Occasionally we'll refer to him as Solomon, but I want to use the term because there's a reason for why he uses this. There's an element of mystery to it, but it is also an official title that he uses in regards to himself. In the English text, we have verse 1, it is the preacher, and it's translated that way. But the interesting thing that in the Hebrew, the article is never used except for in chapter 12, verse 8. It's the only time the article, the, is used with preacher in Hebrew. Every other time it's an arthritis. There's no article. He is by quality, if you will. He is by quality preacher. In other words, I function this way, but he wants us to understand that this is an official title. And so he gives us that in the end of this work in chapter 12, verse 8. And so it's interesting because as he speaks to us then, he's not speaking as a king. He's speaking as a preacher. 
He's speaking as a teacher. He's giving us instruction. He's not laying down decrees. Therefore, he's not just talking to the nation of Israel. He's not merely talking about those who belong to his kingdom. He is talking to everyone. In other words, this is a universal message. So the exhortation to us from Ecclesiastes from the get-go is that we should take this book, sit down with one of our unbelieving neighbors, and share with them the truth of what Solomon lays out for us in this. So he's going to take us on this journey of instruction. He's going to weigh these words carefully. He's going to study them. He's going to arrange them. He's not giving us decrees. But it is important for us to understand the royal backdrop because it is important for us to understand the journey that he took in his own life. And so although his name isn't directly mentioned in the text, everything that he gives us clue-wise points to Solomon as the author of this book. Four things he's going to highlight in Ecclesiastes in the first couple chapters, but he's going to carry this through the, the book, but we find this in 1 Kings. The first thing is wisdom. Solomon was one of the wisest men that ever walked this planet. And the interesting thing is that when you look at the record of his life, that his father, David, thought he was also wise and intelligent before he was even given the gift of wisdom and understanding from God. So this was a man who had capability. But then he had that capability given to him by God as he made the request, I want understanding. Not only that, but he was a man of many works. We find this in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, and we find this throughout 1 Kings. There were many things that he built, so many structures he put up. There were cities, entire cities that he constructed. Not only that, but he had wealth. We find this in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, and then 1 Kings 10. And then the words and the teaching that came from Solomon. He was a man who gave great instruction in one of the, the amazing books that we have is Proverbs something that he composed. And thus I would plant this thought in your head because some have suggested that maybe Solomon was not a believer and he became a believer as he's writing Ecclesiastes, but I would suggest to you that that is not so. But he also is a one of great words, and so this is the scene that he sets for us. We could refer to him as a philosopher. He was a scientist. He was a diplomat. This man was incredibly brilliant. He was brilliant before God even gave him the gift that he asked for. But he also wrote three books for us in Scripture. We have Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and then we have two Psalms, Psalm 72 and 127. And if you want a great psalm on being a workaholic, read Psalm 127. Great psalm. Many lessons for us to learn there. He's considered one of the wisest men then that has ever lived, perhaps the richest who has ever lived. He had fleets of ships that would go out and they would bring back gold to him almost on a daily basis from far off lands. In other words, Trump has nothing on Solomon. And you can think of any billionaire that's out there and I guarantee you he had more money than they will ever have. This man was not devoid of means. He had thousands of servants, tremendous amounts of land. He built two major cities, Hazor, and he also did Megiddo. And he established both of those cities. He built the temple, right, for the people to worship in, to be God's residence. He dedicated in 1 Kings chapter 8, where all of these construction projects that he did, but he owned all of this land. Not only that, but he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. (laughs) One's enough for me, right? But 700? And most of the concubines, right, were for whatever reason, but with the 700 wives, a lot of that had to do with politics. One of the the wives that he had was a princess from Egypt, and that's how he established a relationship with Egypt, and therefore he had an alliance with them. So many of his marriages, that's what they were for. But nonetheless, this was his existence. As a result of their influence, though, in his life, they caused Solomon to take his eyes off of the Lord and turn his eyes upon himself and his desires and pleasures in life. And this is what he lays out for us in Ecclesiastes. This is the journey that I took. In other words, for Solomon, there were no limits or restraints. In other words, when I think about this, I think about, you know, sometimes you hear kids, they say this one, you know, if their parents don't let them have candy, and they'll say, you know, I can't wait till I get older and get a job, then I can buy all the candy I want, right? Until then they get old enough, they get a job, and they have bills to pay, right? But the thought is that I will have no limitation, I'll have all the money, and therefore I can buy all the candy that I want to eat. Solomon had no restraint on anything. He didn't ever have to sit there and say, you know what, I really don't have the money for this. 
He had money to erect entire cities. He could build massive parks for himself. I mean, not just having a nice manicured lawn, but entire parks he had established. And then he had these irrigation pools and canals that would feed these things. And then he had groves and groves of trees, right, that he could delight himself with. He had everything that was possible, and there was no restraint on him. But he will tell us that he will walk all, all the way through this with wisdom, though. In other words, this was sort of, if you will, a, a, a test, but it was under scrutiny. He abandoned himself, but not completely and totally. That he was thinking all the way through the processes of everything that he was going through. The other designation that he gives us here in verse 1 is that he is the son of David, that he is king in Jerusalem. And this notes the, the royalty aspect of his lineage. And it's interesting because this royalty aspect will die off after the first few chapters. We don't encounter it anymore after that. In other words, he sets the groundwork for us. But he wants us to understand that when he makes his declaration of vanity and futility and frustration, it's from a standpoint of superiority and self-fulfillment. In other words, I tried to find fulfillment in myself. I tried what Nietzsche suggested, right? I tried to reason from myself and find meaning and purpose in my life from myself using my own reason in the process and my own intellect, and I found that I came up wanting. He was surrounded by such success and opulence and pleasure. Anything that he desired, he had. But in the end, he said it was a miserable existence. So it is interesting as we walk through Ecclesiastes because we will encounter some philosophical thoughts. One of them I had as I was walking through the, the statements that he makes about himself was I started thinking about Nietzsche and his ubermensch. And, and Nietzsche in his Ubermensch, you know, this was tied up with the, the statement that he made that God is dead. This was a part of it. In other words, God is dead. He doesn't exist. And really, if man's going to find meaning and purpose in his life, he begins with himself. And he reasons out from that. And so he referred to man as, if you will, in the sense of superior. He was the superman or he was the superhuman. If you will, Uber meant superiority or transcendence. And this is what he thought of man, was that man had this ability to become great in and of himself. He could be majestic, and he was a majestic creature, and he didn't need God for this. He could declare it about himself. And it wasn't just about male beings. It was about all human beings everywhere. And he decided that this was something that we needed to see and understand and seek out. And so what he did was he challenged those who followed his teaching to ignore anyone who suggested that there was anything beyond that which was under the sun. In other words, Nietzsche was an earthbound man. And Solomon is going to say, look, I tried seeing the world from this perspective. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So we will find that the things that Solomon lays out here, the principles that he establishes and the concepts, they're for every age. And these philosophical ideas don't just die away. They continue to resurrect themselves and to float around in our environment. There are many who probably don't even know the name of Nietzsche and not understand that they are following his teaching. So the movies my younger kids like to watch is those movies, God is not dead, but that's a response to who? Nietzsche, who declared that God is dead. And we don't need God anymore, and all we do is need man. And really his fight was against believers because believers were suggesting that there is something beyond this realm, that it isn't just about under the sun. There is something beyond all of this. We are not earthbound, but there is a heavenly reality, and God is there as, if you will, uh, Francis Schaeffer used the terminology. So Nietzsche taught this Ubermensch, and he talked about the fact that we can create our own values. We see this within society today. Those at the, the elite at the top, they are the ones who declare to us the new value system that we're all supposed to live by. This is not something new. And Solomon is going to deal with all of this, and humanity can have this Ubermensch as the goal, this Superman. Well, Solomon is the Super Solomon, and this is how he refers to himself in chapter 1, verse 16. He refers to himself as surpassing or abundant in knowledge and wisdom. He is the Super Solomon. He understands, listen to me, I was a gifted man. I had everything you could possibly think of. And if you look at any of the kings that came after him, he outstripped them all. But at the same time, he realized that in the end of all of this, I was empty handed. Everything I had was nothing. It was empty. 
Sometimes we find ourselves thinking along these lines and don't realize we're doing that. When we look for fulfillment in our life from jobs or relationships and things around us, neighborhoods that we live in. There was one couple that lived down the street from us and they had a nice house. It was a nice two-story place. And yet he wanted a bigger house and he wanted to live in a nice gated community. So they found a nicer neighborhood and they found a gated community and they bought a house there and they moved there and all of that. And they wanted to have all the bells and the whistles and he wanted to be the king of his castle. And he thought this is where he was going to find all of this fulfillment in life. And what he found was emptiness in the end of it all. What ended up happening in his life, he ended up being driven to drink. And I don't even know if he's still alive today. But he sought it in his job. The job wasn't fulfilling. Then he sought it in the lifestyle. The lifestyle wasn't fulfilling. He sought it in possessions. Possessions were not filling. And Solomon says, I've been there. I've done that. And you're empty handed if you try to live life without God. In other words, for there to be meaning in life, it, it, it takes that infinite reference point. We understand this as human beings, as creatures. It demands the fact that our existence, our meaning and purpose relies on something outside of ourselves. Everything about us screams this. And our neighbors need to know this. And we need to bring Ecclesiastes and come alongside of them and help them understand that these ideas are still floating out there. They're walking around thinking that somehow they can find fulfillment in something other than the sun and something that is earthbound completely. And they're going to find that it is all empty and it is vanity, as Solomon says. So the thesis statement comes in verse 2, everything is vanity. And he is going to refer to the fact that man lives in a world that's riddled with vanity and futility and frustration. The whole world order has been subjected to this futility. Look at creation around us and nature as it flows. It's just this endless cycle around and around and around and around it goes. There's endless seeing and there's endless hearing and there's never full satisfaction. Human beings struggle to live. They meet frustration at every turn. And this causes us to look all the way back to Genesis. And he's going to refer to this in chapter 7, verse 20, the fall of man. There was a, a state of righteousness in which he existed. But when he fell, then all of a sudden, everything is subjected to futility. Man chooses to be self-centered and self-guided instead of remaining God-centered and God-guidance. And therefore, this brought on the frustration. This brought on the vanity. This brought on the earthboundness. And therefore, we cannot find satisfaction in our life except for in God himself. But here's the amazing thing. When we find satisfaction in God, we can then appreciate the things in the world because Solomon is going to challenge us to do that, to enjoy the work that God gives us to do, to enjoy the labor that he gives us to do, to enjoy the life that he gives us. And these are the bright points that come in the book. And over and over, he's going to exhort us to rejoice in these gifts from God. There are 12 of them total of gifts that God gives to us, but we can only delight in them and enjoy them for what they are if we find our total satisfaction in God and we need to understand right the saying goes that that our chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever do you realize that that the more that we enjoy God that is when he is most glorified in us when we find our ultimate joy and satisfaction in him in our life and when we can do this we can appreciate the things around us and we can enjoy the things in the life that he gives us whether it be cars, whether it be houses and all of these things, we can see them for what they are. But if we try to view them without God in the picture, Solomon says it's just emptiness then. And you won't understand the goodness of God. So under the sun is going to be a refrain. He sets the context for us for the first few chapters, but he's going to return to this thought under the sun, under the sun, and this establishes the limits. This also helps us to understand again that he is painting a universal picture. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, these trees are the same, anywhere and everywhere. This is the important thing about him being referred to as Koheleth and not just merely as the king because he wants us to understand this book isn't just about me and my kingdom. It is about the world overall. It is for all of humanity to hear this message. And we need to take them this message. We need to help unbelievers see the futility of their way of thinking. 
In other words, their belief system and their religiosity, and it's a secular religion, but they need to understand where this will ultimately lead them if they go this way and continue this way. They need to see the futility in this and the absolute insanity in this. I had a priest and I was watching an interview with him, Anglican priest, and he was turned away from the, the Church of England because he was speaking out about pedophiles. But this is something that is becoming favorable within society in England. This is the new letter that they're going to add to the LBGTQ. It is pedophilia. He says, here's the thing. If you can have a grown man in his 40s say, I identify as a 12-year-old young man, then I can then be with a 12-year-old girl. This is the mentality. This is insanity. Two plus two does not equal four anymore. In our universities now, the secular ones, it's five, it's ten, it's whatever you want it to be. This is lunacy. And this is what Solomon says. You try to live life without God, and this is what happens. Everything unravels. So this is a message for everyone around us, and we need to take this message to the world. The backdrop then, as we saw, is the fall. It is the curse. The, the meaning of the statement, everything is vanity. It's an interesting word that he uses here. And it is Havel, and he's going to use it all the way through this work. But it has several meanings. It can mean vanity. It can mean emptiness, enigma. It is something that has no real substance, no value, no permanence, no significance. The reason why Solomon chooses this is because he is going to add layers onto this term. And it is such an ambiguous term that it is so useful for him to do what he wants to do. So he is going to use this word through this work, but he's going to use it in every context that he uses it. He has a new truth he's going to help us understand about this Havel. And he's going to help us to understand the reality of this vanity and all of its dimensions. Not only that, but he will also help add the definition to this by the terms that he uses alongside of it. One of the words he uses in verse 3 is he talks about the fact to ask the question, what advantage does a man have in his work which he does under the sun? This word for advantage is actually a term that comes from business. It is what gain or what profit is there. Get troll. And so he uses this with this term Havel. And he's going to use Havel all the way through here in all these different dimensions. So it's going to have some elasticity for us, but it's going to have different significances as he walks through this. So, for example, Havel, when he uses it in reference to man and his life, it's going to reflect that which is transient or fleeting. He's going to use it in relation to things that we do. Therefore, they are futile, they are fruitless, they are unbeneficial. Or he's going to use it with terms like he does in verse 3, and he's going to show that these things are profitless. So he takes this one term, Havel, and he is going to show the amazingness of this word. He takes it because it's ambiguous, but he can show all of these different aspects to it as he walks through the book of Ecclesiastes. Unfortunately, a lot of translations try to translate it differently every single context in which they find it, but what they do is they miss out what Solomon is doing, and they miss out on the beauty of this. In other words, remember, chapter 12, I chose these words carefully. I pondered these words. I studied on them, and I have arranged them exactly so. So if you want to understand my message, you need to use my words. And so Solomon is going to encourage us to do that, and we will do that. The scope of the statement, then, is everything. All is vanity. There is nothing left out of this declaration. Five times in verse 2, he uses this word, Havel. And it's interesting that four of the times he uses it in a twofold repetition with this superlative construction. In other words, you cannot miss the intensity of this. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, right? And he's going to say this over and over and over again, which made me think of another superlative we find in Scripture. Scripture. Here we have the vanity of vanities, but we also have the holy of holies. Solomon sets up for us, if you will, this utter emptiness which stands in mute contrast to utter holiness. I will leave these thoughts for you to ponder as we come back next week and we will look at verses 4 and following this amazing poem that he constructs for us. It is a beautiful thing. Two images he's going to give us in verses 5 and 6 that he's going to carry out throughout Ecclesiastes. So as you read on through the rest of this book, keep verses 5 and 6 in mind as you do so. And some doors will unlock for you and open up to the truths that Solomon has for us. Dad, would you close us in a word of prayer?